Happy Easter, everybody. I am so glad that you chose to celebrate Easter with us, especially this year. Especially this year because I'm quite certain that the Easter story is more relevant to us here and now in 2021 than it has ever been before. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking you're a pastor. You're supposed to say things like that. But hear me out. Some 2,000 years ago, when those first followers first heard the Easter story, they recognized something. You see, they recognized that resurrection wasn't just something that happened to Jesus at the end of his life and, and at the end of their lives, for that matter. Resurrection was something that God wanted to give to them and to us here and now. Those first followers, they found themselves in the aftermath of the cross and the crucifixion, in the midst of all that divisiveness, all that chaos, all that uneasiness, and all that was dividing them at that time. They found and recognized that the Easter story the Easter story unified them, it brought them together, it solidified them unlike anything they had ever experienced before and would ever experience after. You see, their lives were resurrected, you could say. Their sense of being one, it was resurrected. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at the world around us and all the divisiveness and all that's been ugly over the last year, it seems to me that that's a story that people like you and me need to hear. Well, before we get to that, my friend Sarah Severson is going to sing a song for you. You might recognize Sarah from her work at care facilities around the community. You might recognize her as the blonde from the blonde and the bohunk. But today she's going to sing for us. And maybe it's not in the style that, that you're accustomed to hearing, especially on Easter, but it's a song I want us all to sit back and listen to. Listen to the words as Sarah shares with us the Easter story.
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. There's a phrase that I've come to love over the last year, and it's probably a phrase that you have heard. It's a phrase that describes, I think, what's been going on in our world over, well, over the last year. And the phrase goes something like this. We're all in the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. Let me say that again. We are all in the same storm, but we are not in the same boat. Here's what I know. You and I, we have felt that over this last year. For example, many of you, many of you took spring break trips over the, the last several weeks. You went maybe to Fort Myers or Fort Lauderdale. Well, others of you, others of you just got your vaccination and for the first time in a whole year, you made a trip to a restaurant, huh? We are all in the same storm, but we are not, we are definitely not in the same in the same boat. For some of you, when it comes to your work life, your work life this last year has gone on as normal. In fact, I talked to a contractor the other day. He said that this has been his best year of business ever. Well, for others of you, you've had to scrape and claw to make ends meet this year. Maybe you've had to move your office to a home office. If you're a stay-at-home mom, you've had to help your kids distance learning, then send them to school, and now, now you have them back at home again, and you're tired. You see, here's the thing. We are all in the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. I think about technology. Technology is changing so fast, so fast that some of you, you've said enough with it and you feel, well, you feel left in the dust. I was thinking the other day, for some of our youngsters, TikTok is a fun app to create videos on their phone. For others of you, TikTok is what your grandfather clock does all day long. You see, we're all in the same storm, but we are definitely not in the same boat. And I hate to do this on Easter, but you know as well as I that politics, politics have us going in all kinds of different directions. We are not in the same boat. In fact, we even have come to the place where it's, it's actually hard to have a conversation with somebody who leans to the other side of the aisle, the side that maybe you disagree with. Folks, I don't have to tell you this. We are all in the same storm, but we are not in the same boat. And here's what I wish I could tell you. I wish I could tell you that at the end of this crazy year we're living through, when COVID is a thing of the past, I wish I could tell you that we're going to all go back to normal. All these divisions will be gone, that unicorns will come from the sky, there'll be pots of gold at the end of every rainbow but you're smarter than that. You see, you feel 
what's been going on. You feel what I feel. Something's changed. Something's changed in our culture. Something's changed in the way we relate to one another, in the ways that we talk with one another. Something's changed in the climate. Something's changed. Something's changed in us. I I think it's true of all of us that we have this temptation that when someone doesn't see it my way, I just walk away. I unfollow, I unfriend, I block them. Well, I hate to depress you on this Easter morning, but here's the deal. Jesus must have known on that first Easter what you and I go through, what you and I are facing today in 2021, because Jesus did something way back when, some 2,000 years ago, that was actually kind of remarkable. You see, on the night when Jesus, Jesus was gathered with his disciples for the last time, Jesus prayed about the very situation we find ourselves in today. Jesus was gathered with his disciples, knowing that he was going to the cross. And so he prayed for his disciples. He prayed that God would protect them, that God would comfort them in his absence. But then this prayer took a turn, and it was a sharp turn. Because it was almost like Jesus was looking at you and me here and now in 2021. It's it's as if he knew what we would face, and he looked through the chasm of all those years between then and now, and he prayed for us. It says this. It says his prayer went like this. My prayer is not for them alone. My prayer isn't just for these disciples I'm with here and now. I pray also for those who will believe in me. That's you. And that's me. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. That we would be one. One, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. On that very last night when he's with his disciples and he knows the cross is coming, he prays for you and me. He looks across the chasm of all these years. He looks at you and me and hears his prayer that we would be one. And not just one, but rather that we would be one like Jesus and the Father were one. He prayed that we would be one. And here's the interesting thing. From that point on in the Easter story, again and again and again and again, Jesus is going to paint a picture for us of what oneness looks like. He's going to paint a picture of what being one will take. He's going to paint a picture of what what the sort of being one that he wants to give to us looks like. Well, it starts before Jesus even gets to the tomb. If you know the Easter story, Jesus Jesus was arrested on some trumped-up charges, and he was tried and placed on. On a cross. And there on the cross, he found himself between two criminals. Now, these guys were real criminals. We don't know what they did, but they likely were guilty of murder or stealing from the empire. These guys were felons. They deserved to be on the cross. They were nothing. They were nothing like Jesus at all. And it's sort of interesting because one of those real criminals that hung on the cross next to Jesus, in a moment of what I believe was desperation, knowing that he was about to die, knowing that he had no plan B, I think he turned to Jesus and he cried out. It says this, and he said, Jesus Jesus, would you remember me when you come into my kingdom? Sort of a desperate plea. And listen how Jesus responds. Jesus answered him, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me 
in paradise. Jesus tells this thug. Jesus tells this sinner. Jesus tells this felon, this criminal, this guy who was nothing like him. You're going to be in paradise with me. You see, Jesus embraces this criminal. Someone that was nothing like him because there's something Jesus knew. Jesus knew that embrace, embrace creates space for grace. Jesus knew that embrace creates space for grace. Jesus knew that if he embraced this man who was nothing like him at all, that he would create a space between them. He was able to give him resurrected life. He was able to promise him that they were going to be together in paradise. Because Jesus knew that embrace, embracing those who are nothing like us, embrace creates a space for grace. What does the sort of being one look like that Jesus prayed for you and me? It looks like an embrace. An embrace that creates space for grace. Well, the story says... And you know this, that Jesus would eventually die on that cross. He would be placed in a tomb. Mary would run to the tomb. And there, there would be an angel who declared this. It declared, he is not here, but has risen. And it's interesting. Jesus first appears. He appears to a couple of men who are on the road from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus. These two had been in Jerusalem. They were followers of Jesus. They had given up a lot to be followers of Jesus. But they had watched the cross. They had watched him die that painful death, and they were done. They had quit believing. Because here's the deal. Messiahs don't die. Saviors don't die. As they walked on that road to Emmaus, they felt we've been duped. And to make matters worse, they heard rumors that That those women who went to the tomb and those disciples, that they had this crazy story. That this Jesus had come come back to life. It's crazy. They, They were fed up. They were done believing what all the other disciples believed. But Jesus chose, well, Jesus chose to appear To them. The story goes like this Jesus was walking along the road next to them, but they didn't recognize him. It says, Jesus, he asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? And I imagine they looked at Jesus and said, "Um, What rock did you just crawl out from under? Everybody knew what had happened. We've been talking about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God. And all the people, the chief priests and our rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But then they got honest. They said, we had hoped. We had hoped. We had placed our belief that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more It is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions, they went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. You see, these two men on the road who didn't recognize Jesus, they were done. They were done believing. They were done believing what everyone else believed about who Jesus was. But Jesus chose to show up to them. You see, the resurrected Jesus came to those who didn't believe the same. The same as all those disciples. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, came to those who didn't believe the same. What does being one The being one that Jesus prayed for you and me on his last night here on earth, it looks like this. The resurrected Jesus came to those who didn't believe the same, the believe the same as all his other disciples. Well, Jesus would appear to all the 12 except for one. 
except for one. His name was Thomas. We often call him Doubting Thomas. We don't know what he was doing when Jesus appeared then to all the other 12 disciples, but Thomas, for some reason, wasn't there. And when the disciples told him all about this Jesus and that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead, he was having nothing of it. He was, he was the odd man out. He was the skeptic. He was not going to believe. You see, Thomas saw things in a different way than the others saw things. And he was not. He wasn't going, he wasn't going to conform. But what's interesting, interesting about the Easter story is that Jesus came back for the one, for that one Thomas. The story went like this. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he turned to Thomas, the one who wasn't going to believe, the one who wasn't going to conform, the one who was the odd man out, the one I imagine the rest of the disciples wanted to throttle and just say, come on, Thomas. Then Thomas, Jesus looked at Thomas and said, put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. You see, Jesus came back for the one. And Jesus always comes back for the one. Jesus comes back for the one who was the odd man out. He comes back for the one who wouldn't conform. He comes back for the one who didn't believe as others believed. He came back for the one who didn't see things the way others saw things. Jesus came back for the one. So maybe this Easter, the uncomfortable question is this. Who is the one in your life? The one maybe who doesn't see things the way you see things, the one who doesn't believe the way you believe, the one that you sort of avoid at family gatherings, the one you avoid at work, the one you avoid at practice or at school. Who is the one in your life? Or maybe, or maybe you are the one. You're the one who's made to feel like you're the odd man out. You're made to feel most days like nobody sees things the way you see things. Nobody believes the way you believe. Maybe you are the one, and if you are the one, here's what I want you to know. Jesus comes back for the one. Jesus always comes back for the one. In fact, that's what at the heart of the Easter story. Nothing will keep Jesus from people like you and me. Jesus always comes back for the one. Not even death, no doubt, no disbelief, no nothing will keep God, God from you. On that night, that night as Jesus gathered his disciples for the very last time, he prayed. He prayed that we would be one. It was like he knew somehow what all of us would be facing here in 2021. And then he paints a picture of it. He paints a picture of what, of what being one looks like, what being one takes. He paints a picture of the sort of being one he wants to give to people like you and people like me. Being one looks like embrace. Embrace that creates the space, the space for grace. Uh, being one, it looks like the resurrected Jesus, the resurrected Jesus who came. To those who didn't believe the same, it looks like the resurrected Jesus who always came back for the one. Yes, the Easter story is all about this God of ours defeating death, defeating the grave. And somehow in the midst of the mystery of our faith, we are inheritors of that, of that eternal life. That's what Easter is about. But I think way back when those first followers realized, realized that that's not all. 
They realized that God wanted to give us something here and now, that the Easter story was about us receiving something here and now. You see, God wants to resurrect you and me here and now. God wants to resurrect those broken relationships in your life. We have a God who wants to resurrect us from all the divisiveness and ugliness we've experienced over, over the last year. God wants to resurrect those relationships within your family that have experienced tension. God wants to resurrect us from our isolation that has led to way too much intoleration. God wants to resurrect people like you and me from that little voice in the back of our head that looks at some people and says, I just don't know if I can love them. On that night, when he gathered with his disciples, he prayed for you and he prayed for me. It was his Easter prayer. And that prayer went like this, that we would be one. Because in being one, here's what I think Jesus knew. Jesus knew that in being one, we would get a taste of what resurrection is all about. We would get a taste of what resurrected life is all is all about. We would get a taste of the Easter story. The Easter story that goes like this. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards, the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. 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 He is
fought the fight, the battle won. Alleluia. Death in vain forbids him rise. Alleluia. Christ has opened paradise. Join us as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for Easter worship here today at Calvary. Here at the church, we have been busy focusing on our mission, which is to lead all people to a lifelong faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm so excited to tell you about how you can take your next step in your faith journey. On April 18th, we are gonna fight hunger huge in the biggest way possible right here at Calvary. We're partnering with an organization called Meals from the Heart. Now Meals from the Heart is an organization that brings people together to serve their neighbors through easy to execute, energized, fun meal packing events that will stay right here in our community. Here's the cool thing about these meals. They only cost 25 cents a meal and we are packing, ready for it? 100,000 meals, and I am so excited to do this with you. To pull it off, I wanna invite you to consider donating 10, 20, 100, or 1,000 meals, and consider volunteering an hour of your time on April 18th. We need over 400 volunteers to make these 100,000 meals to happen, and that means you. This is a great project to do with people of all ages together, from two-year-olds to 92-year-olds. The shifts are only an hour, so your whole family can join and volunteer for an hour together. You can sign up to volunteer or to donate on our Easter with Calvary website, www.easterwithcalvary.com. If you're new to Calvary, I wanna invite you to join our email list. You can do this on our website at www.calvaryalex.org and click on, I wanna sign up for emails. That way you'll be the first to know of all the things that are going on here at Calvary. If you've had the chance today to worship with other people, maybe your family, and you'd like to enjoy communion together, to enjoy the Lord's Supper together, you can go to our website at www.calvaryalex.org and click on the button that says communion. There are some resources there for you to be able to share communion, as well as a full traditional communion liturgy for you to be able to watch and enjoy the Lord's Supper in your home. There's also a discussion guide out there on that same website that you can go and you can think farther about the message that Pastor Hans shared with you today. And now as we close our time together, we're gonna to close with a time of offering. We are so grateful for your generosity. It's because of your generosity that we get to do things like pack 100,000 meals coming up. And there are four ways that you can give and they're gonna be on your screen. The first is that you can go to the website, www.calvaryalex.org and click on the button that says give. The second is that you can text Calvary Alex to 77977 and then follow the prompts. The third is that you can write a check and mail it to the church at 605 Douglas Street, Alexandria, Minnesota, 56308. And the fourth is that you can call the church office with the number on your screen and we'll help you figure it all out. He is risen. Happy Easter, everyone.